Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out. I'm Dan Coppitz, and tonight the Harvard Center of Mathematical Sciences and Applications is happy to host the second annual YIP lecture, made possible with the generous support of Dr. Yip, who unfortunately can't join us in person tonight. Uh, we're all very excited to have Professor Avi Loeb as this year's distinguished speaker. Uh, Avi is currently the Frank Baird Professor of Science at Harvard University. He received his PhD in physics from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and was a long-term member at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. He's written eight books and nearly a thousand papers on a wide range of topics, including black holes, the first stars, and the search for extraterrestrial life. He's the head of the Galileo Project in search of extraterrestrial intelligence and the director of the Institute for Theory and Computation at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Avi served as chair of the Harvard Department of Astronomy and was the founding director of Harvard's Black Hole Initiative. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Physical Society, and the International Academy of Astronautics. Avi is a former member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology and a former chair of the Board on Physics and Astronomy for the National Academies. He also chairs the Advisory Committee for the Breakthrough Starshot Initiative and serves as the Science Theory Director for all initiatives of the Breakthrough Prize Foundation. And tonight he's here to tell us all about extraterrestrial life. So with that, please take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, we could have saved a lot of time um, if I would have known that uh, the introduction would be that long. I would have said, just introduce me as a farm boy. I was born on a farm, and that's fundamentally what I am. Uh, I've tried not to abandon my childhood curiosity. Um, what you see in the middle is a, the cover of a book that I published a year ago. It just came out in paperback called Extraterrestrial. We'll discuss the content in this talk. And if I had to summarize it in one sentence, I would say, when you're not ready to discover wonderful things, you would never discover them. What you see on the right side is the cover of a textbook more than a thousand pages long that we wrote with uh, my former postdoc, Manasvi Lingam, Life in the Cosmos, published by Harvard University Press half a year ago. And it will serve uh, as a textbook for future research on this subject in the search of microbial life, primitive forms of life, as well as intelligent life, technological relics that I'll describe today. What you see on the left side is a picture of a photograph that was hung on the walls of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Arts and Sciences a couple of years ago it was taken by the German photographer, Herlinda Quilbel, who came to my office and asked me to write on the palm of my hand the question that I regard as most fundamental in science. And I wrote, are we alone? Now, my book, Extraterrestrial, <laughs> inspired a few things that were unexpected, actually. The last year was quite... Uh, Unusual, as far as I'm concerned. There were a few multi-billionaires that visited the porch of my home. Uh, there were about 2,500 interviews since my book appeared that I was able to attend because of the pandemic from home, almost back to back most of the days. Um, but the one unusual thing that I received an email about is that there was even a sermon delivered <laughs> in a synagogue uh, about my book, in, uh, and uh, it's a congregation in Ann Arbor, and uh, I found it interesting that uh, there is a connection between spirituality and the search for life beyond Earth. And a colleague of mine, when he, uh, I showed him this uh, email, he said, next time we meet for dinner, my wife and I will ask you to give a sermon. To which my reply was, I would never lead a congregation whose members agree with me. <laughs> now, another thing that was surprising is a winemaker called Bonnie Doon, quite famous uh, vineyard uh, in Santa Cruz, uh, decided to have a brand of wine. Uh, the name was uh, 
Kuve or Muamua. And uh, that was invented, uh, inspired by my book. It, it actually, in the description, it says that uh, uh, the former chairman of the astronomy department at Harvard argues that an object might have been solar-powered light sail. And so he was inspired to invent this wine, which I, of course, bought a case of, and just to celebrate this. Um, but as I mentioned before, fundamentally, um, I was shaped during my childhood. And the one vivid memory I have, which is the most traumatic as a child, was sitting at dinner and asking a difficult question. And the adults in the room who didn't know the answer would dismiss the question. And I was very frustrated by that. They would just ignore the question and say it's not important. And it was obvious that they do that because they don't know the answer to the question. Not because the question was unimportant. So I decided to go into science and be surrounded by like-minded people who try to find the answers to questions based on evidence and admit when they don't know the answer to a question. And unfortunately, much of science these days, and it's true in many different disciplines, is dominated by quote-unquote experts who are motivated to be the adults in the room. That's how they get their prestige in acquiring honors, awards, and so forth. Um, and they dismiss questions just because they don't know the answer. And the one thing to keep in mind, why is this dangerous to science? It's because um, humans prefer to believe in virtual realities. That's the business model of the metaverse. You can make money out of it by putting goggles on the heads of people so that they see what, they, what gives them pleasure. That's the business model of the metaverse. But this is not a new phenomenon. Humans used to belong to groups that believed in virtual realities, cults, all kinds of religions. Uh, humans put makeup. You know, that's a virtual reality. But as a scientist, I really want to see the pimples on the face of reality. Because reality can give you pleasure. For example, you can build a computer that will host these ideas about the metaverse. That's something real that you can do. And science enables that. Quantum mechanics was discovered a century ago and allows us to build all these gadgets that we have. So that's the pleasure that we get from understanding reality through science. But when you understand reality, it also puts constraints on what you can do. So when you talk about going to, for example, Mars, or bringing a trillion people to space, like some very wealthy individuals these days are talking about, you have to realize that if a human spends more than a few years in space, there would be severe damage to their body as a result of cosmic rays, energetic particles hitting it. So you have to understand reality with its pimples. You can't put makeup on the face of reality. And that's if you, um, if you screen science or you screen your investigations such that it will always bring you pleasure, you are limiting yourself in exposing what reality is about. So let me illustrate what the scientific method is all about. And that's based on a paper that I wrote just a couple of weeks ago. It was posted on the archive. So most of the matter in the universe is of an unknown nature. There is five times more stuff than ordinary matter that we are made of. Um, in fact, even the COVID-19 virus was invisible to us, but it's made of ordinary matter. Uh, it would have been nice if it had some color so we can uh, run away from it. But there is matter in the universe, most of the matter, that is completely invisible. It doesn't interact with light. That's, it, it's quite uh, humbling to 
admit that for a hundred years we've been studying the universe and we still don't know what it's made of, most, what most of the matter is. There is, of course, in addition to that, the vacuum energy density, which is a separate issue by itself, but most of the matter is unknown. We call it dark matter just for, to reflect our ignorance. And the simplest version of this matter is called cold dark matter. And what that means is that by the time galaxies started to form in the universe, this matter was extremely cold, almost at zero temperatures. So it did, particles did not have much of a velocity dispersion. And one prediction of this model is that when galaxies form, the centers of galaxies have cusps, a divergence in the distribution of dark matter. And small galaxies, dwarf galaxies, do not show that in the real universe. So that's one of the problems, uh, challenges of uh, cold dark matter. It's not completely clear yet uh, how general this challenge is. But a couple of weeks ago, I suggested, okay, well, in fact, if the dark matter is organized into clumps, roughly 10,000 times the mass of the sun, they would scatter on each other gravitationally and flatten the central cusps in the distribution at the centers of dwarf galaxies. And when you go to bigger systems, like clusters of galaxies, the effect would be much smaller because this gravitational scattering is much weaker at higher speeds that represent those bigger systems. So a few hours after I posted this paper on the archive, I got an email from a professor at the University of Toronto who said, I can rule out your model by future data that will come from two observatories, we can actually test uh, whether this model of the dark matter being organized to clumps is valid or not, because if it's organized into clumps, they would disturb very fine filaments of stars that we see in the halo of the Milky Way galaxy. So that's the beauty of science. I was thrilled that a young fellow comes to me and says, we could, in principle, rule out your model. Why? Because if we then go to the data, I would like to know if my model is right or not. And if the data shows it's wrong, then I stop wasting time on this idea. But the data might show that it's right. And science should be guided by evidence, not by prejudice. So this is how the scientific method works. And so my response to him was, indeed, that would be wonderful to try and figure out if you can rule out my model, because I'm still hoping that the model might be ruled in. So what did the scientific method teach us? The most fundamental truth about the universe is that we are not that important. You know, we tend to th believe in this virtual reality where we play a central role, because that brings us pleasure. We can put goggles of the metaverse and still feel that we are very important. But when you look at the real universe, that's not the message you get. Not only that we are not at the center of the universe, as argued thousands of years ago, and the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle said, you know, that we are at the center, and then for a thousand years people believed him because it flattered their ego. But then Copernicus and Galileo realized by looking at the sky, that the earth moves around the sun. And of course, the philosophers at the time put Galileo in house arrest. They, today, they would have canceled him on social media. They didn't want anyone to listen to that. They knew that the sun moves around the earth. But if you were to ask those philosophers to design a space mission that would reach Mars, they would never get to their destination because they thought that Mars moves around the earth. So my point is, reality is whatever it is. It doesn't matter how, how many likes you have for a notion on Twitter. That's completely irrelevant. It's not a popularity contest. Science is about figuring out the reality that we live in, and that's for our benefit, because we need to adapt to whatever pleasure or pain it brings. And by adapting to reality, we can actually accommodate all the constraints that it brings. But if we believe in something that gives us pleasure, you know, we can put Galileo in house arrest. That didn't change the motion of the Earth around the Sun. 
And now, not only that we are not at the center of the universe, we also know that about half of the sun-like stars, and that's from the latest uh, data by the Kepler satellite, half of the sun-like stars have a planet the size of the Earth, roughly at the same separation. So, not only we are not at the center of the universe, we are also what we find in our backyard is not unique or privileged or special. So we better start, have a different starting point. Rather than being attracted to a reality that gives us pleasure, that we are important, unique, we are the only smart species that ever existed, we should start always from the assumption that nothing is special about what we see around us. And that's the sense of cosmic modesty that I think we lacked in the past. And the data keeps bringing it back to us. And the important point is not to try and close yourself in a room and figure out what the world is about just by pure thought, but rather learn from nature, because nature is sometimes more imaginative than we are. And when you see a painting like this one of an emperor or a king, being very proud of himself after conquering a piece of land on Earth, that's not very impressive because there are as many Earth-like planets in the observable volume of the universe as there are grains of sand on all beaches on Earth. So this emperor or king, or think of Putin trying to conquer a small piece of land now, uh, it's, it's, that person is not more impressive than an ant trying to hug a single grain of sand on the landscape of a huge beach. We are not that important. But I can understand where it's coming from because both my daughters, when they were young and they were at home, they tended to think that they are the center of the world, that they are the smartest because they compare themselves to the family members. And that notion changed when we brought them to the kindergarten they had a psychological shock to realize that there is a smarter kid on their block. So our civilization will mature once we meet others. And my point is that Albert Einstein was probably not necessarily the smartest scientist who ever lived since the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. This is a cartoon that was made uh, on the day that Einstein died, sort of like a plaque on, on Earth saying, Albert Einstein lived here, as if that represents humanity to the outside. Well, my point is, there is another planet somewhere else where a scientist smarter than Einstein lived, and perhaps even a billion years ago, because most stars formed billions of years before the sun. We know that. So, the civilization that benefited from the wisdom of that scientist had enough time to launch probes or spacecraft which by now filled the entire Milky Way galaxy and perhaps even the solar system. It's not a philosophical question whether that is the reality that we live in. We shouldn't argue about it philosophically. We just need to look up. That's what Galileo said, look through the telescope. And most stars, as I mentioned, form billions of years before the sun. We know that for a fact because we can, see, we can look back in time and see that stars formed in the universe uh, more vigorously early on. And you can imagine what I call astronauts that have artificial intelligence. They can survive the billions of years of travel between stars, even if one uses chemical rockets. And within a billion years, you can pretty much cover the entire Milky Way galaxy. So AI astronauts may be all around us. And they could, in principle, replicate through 3D printing. So, in order not to repeat the mistake made by philosophers during the days of Galileo, we should look up through our telescopes. 
And the first object that was discovered from outside the solar system was found in October 19th, 2017, just about five years ago. We couldn't find an object from outside the solar system before that because there was never a survey telescope that is sensitive to the reflection of sunlight from an object the size of a football field. And think about it, the size of a football field. NASA never launched a spacecraft the size of a football field. And we are only sensitive to such objects now. So there could be many objects much smaller than that passing by and we wouldn't notice, passing in the dark. This object was given the name Oumuamua, which means a scout in the Hawaiian language because this telescope, PanStars, was in Hawaii. And you see it circled in blue on the background of stars. It originated from a very special frame of reference called the local standard of rest, which is the frame that you get to when you average over the motions of all the stars in the vicinity of the sun. And that's very unusual. Only one in 500 stars is so much at rest as Oumuamua was when it entered the solar system. So it was like a buoy sitting at rest on the surface of the ocean and the solar system like a giant ship bumped into it and gave it a kick through gravity, just like a, a racket giving a kick to a tennis ball. And as the object was tumbling every eight hours, the amount of sunlight reflected from it changed by a factor of 10. And that's a lot. It meant that the area of the object projected on the sky changed by a factor of 10 as it was tumbling. Think about a piece of paper tumbling in the wind. Um, and the best fit to the variation of light was that of a pancake-shaped object, disc-like shape. Uh, this is a paper where it was analyzed that the best fit to the variation of light at the 90% confidence was that of a pancake-shaped object which again is quite unusual. And what was more unusual is that the Spitzer Space Telescope looked at this object and you can see the image on the right side, the upper right side, and it didn't see anything. And the Spitzer Space Telescope was very sensitive to infrared radiation coming from heat or from gases around the object. So it was clearly not a comet. Nothing that is carbon-based was evaporating from it. There was no dust, no carbon-based molecules at a very tight limit. Nevertheless, there was excess push on the object, uh, some force that declined inversely with distance squared from the sun. And without the cometary evaporation, there was no rocket effect expected. So the question is, what gave this object the excess push? And since the force was smooth with time and inversely proportional to distance squared, we suggested in a scientific paper with a former postdoc of mine, Shmuel Bialy, that perhaps it's the reflection of sunlight that is pushing it. Uh, the force was smooth with time. There, were no, there was no jitter, as one expects from evaporation in jets, as you find on comets very often. But nature doesn't make thin, flat objects pushed by sunlight. So I suggested maybe it's artificial. And there were a lot of anomalies, about six of them, that I describe in the book. The actual discovery of this object was a surprise because the abundance of rocks that you expect coming from other stars uh, is expected to be lower by orders of magnitude. We wrote a paper a decade earlier forecasting that based on what we know about the solar system. And uh, aside from all the various uh, anomalies associated with, with um, where the object came from, how it looked like, of course, there was this excess push um, that we suggested is as a result of sunlight. Now, the mainstream Astronomy community, of course, had an issue. There was a lot of pushback against the possibility that it might be artificial. That we, 
we might have another civilization out there that sent it. And what were the proposals, the alternatives uh, to this notion? Uh, one suggestion was maybe it's a cloud of dust particles, very loosely bound, a hundred times less dense than air. We've never seen a cloud of dust particles so loosely bound, the size of a football field. And the problem with that is when it gets close to the sun, it will get heated by hundreds of degrees and will not maintain its integrity. The material strength is not strong enough. So then there was another suggestion, maybe it's a chunk of frozen hydrogen. So when the hydrogen evaporates, it's transparent, we won't see it. Uh, and so it's a comet, but made of just hydrogen. We've never seen a hydrogen iceberg. We don't know if nature makes it. But the real problem with this suggestion is that it will evaporate very quickly as a result of absorbing starlight and would not survive the journey through interstellar space. Then there was a suggestion, okay, well, it's not a hydrogen iceberg, maybe it's a nitrogen iceberg. Again, transparent. And in this case, we know that Pluto has a, uh, a surface layer of solid nitrogen. So the idea is maybe it came from a Pluto-like planet around another star where the surface was chipped off. And the problem with that is there is not enough solid nitrogen in the Milky Way galaxy, if you do the math. So these are the possibilities suggested. And each of them has an, a problem, and all of them contemplate something we've never seen before. The fundamental question is whether Oumuamua was natural or artificial in origin. And the way I think of this is like walking on the beach. And most of the time, you see rocks and seashells that are naturally produced. But every now and then, you may stumble across a plastic bottle. And perhaps that's what Oumuamua was, a message in a bottle. It may be space trash. Now, in September 2020, there was another object discovered by the same telescope in Hawaii. It was given the name 2020 SO. Uh, and it sh shared the same qualities as Oumuamua. It was pushed away from the sun by reflecting sunlight, no cometary tail. And then a few weeks later, the astronomers who discovered it and thought that it might be an asteroid, a rock, they realized that if you extrapolate the trajectory back in time, this object actually came from Earth. It's a rocket booster that was launched by NASA in 1966. It's just the shell. And so it has very thin walls and a large surface area for its mass. So here is an example for an artificial object, which the same telescope discovered. We know that it's artificial because we produced it. The question is, who produced Oumuamua? And a metaphor for the kind of situation we are faced with is, Imagine a cave dweller finding a cell phone. The cave dweller is used to playing with rocks all of his life. So he would argue the cell phone is a rock of a type that we've never seen before. And of course, he, if he will throw away the cell phone and come back to his family, that will be the end of it. But if he's curious, he might press a button and realize that it records his voice and therefore it's not a rock. I would love to press a button if Oumuamua had any. <laughs> now, if you think about searching for relics of other civilizations, you can ask, what's the chance that we will find one? And it's very different from the well-known Drake equation that describes the chance of detecting a radio signal from another civilization, because here, uh, dealing with physical objects. So it's actually simpler. For interstellar objects, the number that you will find is the number of such objects per unit volume times the volume of your survey. It's very simple. Uh, you can also use the Earth as a fishing net because the Earth moves through space and it may collide with objects. And for that, you just need to know the flux of objects, how many objects intercept the surface area of the Earth 
per unit time. And that depends on the number of objects per unit volume times their speed. And all of these quantities, the number, the speed, they may depend on the size of the object. So smaller objects may be much more abundant. Now there is another factor that is extremely important. And I call that the ostrich factor. <laughs> what is the likelihood that we would behave like an ostrich and not perform the search? If that likelihood is 100%, we will find nothing. So the likelihood of discovery depends also on us, not just on them. And we know that we sent a robot, the Perseverance rover, to the surface of Mars. And of course, we feel, we feel very uh, fond of this Perseverance rover, and uh, we hope that it might find evidence that there were microbes on the surface of Mars early on in its life. Um, and that will not threaten our ego in any way we would still feel superior relative to these microbes because we are intelligent. They are not. But what if the same Perseverance rover bumps into the wreckage of an advanced spaceship? That will be a blow to our ego. Not many people will be happy about that. And Fundamentally, this is not a philosophical question, as I try to emphasize. It's not something we should argue about. Because they say a picture is worth a thousand words. In my case, a picture is worth 66,000 words, the number of words in my book. Frankly, I would not need to write the book if I had an image of a muamua, no matter what it is. If it's a nitrogen iceberg, so be it. I wouldn't write anything. I would just show you the image, and that's it. And frankly, I don't need to convince other people about the nature of Oumuamua. It is whatever it is. And what you see on the right side is a photograph that was taken in, uh, using the, the mission uh, OSIRIS-REx that landed on the asteroid Bennu. And you can easily tell that it's a rock and it uh, actually took a sample from this rock that it will bring back to Earth within a year. So it would be fun to land on an interstellar object that looks weird, doesn't look like a comet or an asteroid, like Oumuamua. And that's one aspect of the Galileo project, which uh, we established about half a year ago, after receiving uh, $2 million from uh, several wealthy individuals um, who came to the porch of my home and were inspired by this discussion. So one aspect of the Galileo project is to get a camera close to the next Oumuamua and take a high resolution image of it. We could also observe the next Oumuamua with the James Webb Space Telescope that was launched just a few months ago. Uh, the advantage of that is the James Webb Space Telescope is located at the Lagrange Point 2, so it's one and a half million kilometers away from Earth. So when an, an interstellar object comes along, if we observe it from, with the Webb Telescope and from Earth, we would see it from two different directions, and we can pin down the trajectory of this object very precisely in three dimensions. That's a great advantage that we didn't have with Oumuamua. We can also detect the heat, the infrared emission from this object, and perhaps infer its composition uh, by taking a spectrum of the reflected light from it, or the emitted light. Now, fundamentally, what we would like to do is date the next Oumuamua. And within a year, uh, there will be the legacy survey of space and time of the, Ver of the Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile. Uh, and it will potentially identify interstellar objects that do not resemble asteroids or comets, 
by taking a video of the sky with a 3.2 gigapixel camera. That's quite remarkable, actually. A huge amount of data. But the way I think of this uh, LSST is that it's just like a dating app. We will swipe to the left most of the objects <laughs> and then select one of them that is worth dating for a billion dollars because that will be the cost of a space mission that will come close to an object like Oumuamua. It's a very expensive mission and you have to select very carefully which object you want to go after because otherwise you spend a billion dollars on the wrong date. That's a choice that was never made by NASA. NASA always had an idea of where it wants to send the mission. Here you have to decide in real time, within a month, whether an object is worth chasing or coming close to, rendezvousing with. And I should say that regarding the prospects of such a date, uh, we have a travel, space travel related NFT project that will be uh, put on uh, snowcrash.com uh, and you can follow it up uh, on Twitter. Now, one possibility is that Oumuamua was flat and thin because it was a leaflet. Someone sent out a leaflet with a message on it. And it would be tragic if we miss a love letter in our mailbox because this love letter would expire if we happen to destroy the climate or perish in a war. So, in principle, someone else may, could give us advice about how to handle ourselves better. And if you go to University Hall or Harvard Yard, you find all these statues and paintings of deans or pre former presidents of Harvard who wanted to preserve a physical uh, image of the way they looked by having a painting or, or a statue. Um, but all of these monuments will be erased once in a billion years, once the sun will expand and burn up everything on the surface of Earth within a billion years. If you really wanted a monument of yourself, you would send an AI astronaut to space because it could survive longer than the sun. And it could be autonomous, doesn't need any guidance, can go for a long distance and maintain the flame of your consciousness in a way. That's the best monument, much better than these paintings and uh, statues that you find here. Uh, one thing I should say is the New Horizons mission uh, that went to Pluto was a bit of an embarrassment because it had a box that carried 30 grams of the ashes of Clyde Tambau, the scientist who discovered Pluto. Now, what are ashes? They are no different than the ashes of a cigarette. You take the genetic information of a person you want to commemorate and you destroy it. That doesn't show uh, a scientific uh, uh, intelligence. Uh, in my view, we should send, we should launch a faster spacecraft that overtakes New Horizons and apologizes for it, uh, for this primitive ritual of burning the DNA of a person that NASA wants to commemorate. Because if anyone finds this box, they cannot reconstruct Tambo from the ashes. In order for them to do that, we should have left some electronic record of the DNA of Clyde Tambau or a stem cell. That would have been the intelligent thing to do. Now, um, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, uh, about half a year ago in June uh, 2021, delivered a report to Congress in which they talk about um, objects that they cannot identify near Earth. And the argument was that the scientific community needs to help the government in figuring out what these objects are. And in fact, President Biden signed into law uh, in the new defense bill uh, 
an office, a new office in government that will start operations in June 2022 that will assemble all the information the government has on these objects whose nature is unclear. And obviously, the intelligence agencies would not report about objects that are identified as belonging to adversaries, to other nations. They just couldn't figure out what they are. So that's the second component of the Galileo project, which is to build telescope systems that would try to identify the nature of these objects. And so the Galileo project has two aspects to it. One is to date the next Oumuamua, and the second is to study those objects that the government doesn't know what they are. And obviously we called it after Galileo because he uh, offered this method of learning about the world through telescopes. And if he were alive today, obviously we would make him a honorary member of the project. So we have a lot of uh, exceptional scientists on the project. And as I mentioned, the project has two branches to it. Uh, and one of them is to build telescope systems on the ground that would look up. And uh, the second is to look for more and more like objects. And as of a week ago, we received funding in collaboration with the Southwest Research Institute to start the design of a space mission that will eventually make it to the next Oumuamua. So that's very exciting. We are now starting to work on that. And that means optimizing the trajectory and deciding about which instruments to put on such a mission. At the same time, we are planning to assemble the first telescope system on the roof of the Harvard College Observatory in the coming months. And it will have infrared and visible cameras that you see here, as well as um, radio sensors and uh, audio sensors that uh, will cover the entire sky at all times. So we're taking a video of the sky at all times. And if we identify an object of interest, the fundamental question, is it human-made? Is it a drone, an airplane, or a satellite? Or is it natural, a bird, a meteor, uh, some lightning? Um, or is it something else? And it's a fishing expedition. We don't assume anything. We are completely agnostic about what we may find. So this is the infrared, and uh, uh, it has uh, eight cameras looking at the entire sky at all times, and there is a, a visible light camera that has a f uh, fisheye lens. And um, of course, in visible light, you can find objects during the daytime, and in the infrared, you can look at them also at night if they are warm. Now, Carl Sagan stated, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And a lot of my colleagues keep repeating that mantra. My point is different. Extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. And think about the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, it was supposed to potentially find what the dark matter is. The most popular idea about the dark matter was that it's the lightest supersymmetric particle. So in order to answer whether it's in the natural range of parameters, we invested billions of dollars in the Large Hadron Collider. And unfortunately, we haven't found anything. We didn't find the lightest supersymmetric particle. OK, but that's exactly how science is done. What I'm saying is, if you invest 1% of the budget of the Large Hadron Collider, on the Galileo project, it could provide an answer about these objects out there close to Earth. Just 1%, $100 million, a rather modest scale relative to the Large Hadron Collider. So if in 40 years we will not find any object of interest and we would invest even billions of dollars in that search, we would be at exactly the same point as dark matter searches are right now. 
So how can we say that no extraordinary, there is no extraordinary evidence if we didn't invest the extraordinary funds? We are doing that again and again on different fronts, including the dark matter search. So we should do it also because we sent equipment to space, Voyager, New Horizons, maybe another civilization did the same. So let's just look up and check. But that costs money. You can't just imagine that it will fall on your lap. Uh, of course, we can look for uh, things remotely. For example, we can search for industrial pollution in the atmospheres of other planets. We could search for artificial lights on the night side. I wrote papers on that with an uh, undergraduate student uh, last year. But one thing to keep in mind is there is a tension between the ability of a civilization to send equipment to space and its ability to destroy itself. That's the fundamental tension. And if a civilization is not sending a lot of equipment to space before it inflicts wounds on itself and, and perishes, then within a billion years later, which is a relatively short time, cosmologically speaking, this civilization will be indistinguishable from nature. You won't be able to tell that it existed. Because on Earth, for example, that, that will be the turnover time for geological activity that will basically take all the computer terminals we have on the surface right now and mix them into the Earth's interior. Nothing will be left. So, of course, if we send these monuments to space, something will be left. So my recommendation to Larry Bacow is rather than having a painting in University Hall, send a, an AI astronaut that represents your guiding principles. Now Fermi, Enrico Fermi, a very famous physicist, asked about 70 years ago, he went to lunch in uh, Los Alamos and uh, together with uh, colleagues, uh, they were discussing extraterrestrials. So he was saying, well, if it's so likely for them to be out there, where is everybody? And of course, that is very presumptuous because most of them may be dead by now. And, you know, you can't just sit at home and say, where are my neighbors? I don't hear a knock on the door. You have to look through the windows. You have to search for them. And you better use a telescope. So archaeology, extraterrestrial archaeology in space is needed. And we might find objects that are space trash, that are not functional any anymore. Think about Voyager a billion years from now. It will just be trash. Or you can imagine functional objects like AI astronauts. And we don't have a protocol for how to deal with functional objects. People thought about what will happen if we detect a radio signal from far away. But it takes you know, tens of thousands of years to cross the Milky Way galaxy for a radio signal. So there is no rush. There is no urgency in responding to it. However, if you have a visitor in your backyard, you have to decide what to do about it. Who represents humanity? And even if we establish an organization that represents humanity and decides what to do with this object, there would be someone in the sidelines that would do something different. <laughs> so I'm really worried about this. And there are all kinds of questions. And of course, the encounter could be very enriching for us because it could provide us, for example, for a meaning to our life. If our life was seeded here on Earth, then we will feel just like orphans finding about their lost parents, in a way. So it could give us a meaning. But we can also learn from a smarter kid on our cosmic block. It may feel like cheating in an exam if we ask them, what is the dark matter? What happened before the Big Bang? What is inside the black hole? But if they give us the answers, I would be happy with it rather than spending millions of years in trying to figure the answers ourselves. My hope is that by finding those relics, by realizing that there is a smarter kid on the block, 
it would inspire us to behave better. Because if you look at human history, it's mostly shaped by a group of people trying to feel superior relative to other people. The best example is the Nazi regime that triggered the death of 75 million people. That's a factor of 10 more than the number of deaths triggered by COVID-19. Just think about it. A group of people decided to feel superior relative to other people and killed 3% of the world population in 1940. So if we find that there is a smarter kid on our cosmic block, if we recognize a sense of cosmic modesty, then the differences between us would look meaningless. There is someone much smarter than us out there. And so perhaps that would inspire us to treat each other as equal members of the human species. And the basic message that I started with at the beginning of my talk is that the universe is telling us we are not central players. We are not the central actors in this play. We just came at the end. The universe started 13.8 billion years ago. If you come to a stage and the play has been going on much, much longer than the time you spent on this stage, the play is not about you. Okay? And also, we are not at the center of the stage. So many civilizations could have appeared and disappeared before we developed our technologies. And recorded human history is only 10,000 years old. That's a millionth of the history of the universe. A millionth. So, perhaps in order to figure out what the play is about, we often wonder about the meaning of our life, we should seek other actors. Because they may have been around for longer. And we can learn from them. Thank you.